What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Got a real good guest on today. He was serving a life sentence, ends up doing his own legal work, and gets out. Caught up in the system, I believe, in Georgia. Definitely one of the most dangerous prison systems in the country, at least to me, from the things that I've seen. But anyway, brother, tell the people who you are, where you're from, and talk a little bit about you and how you ended up in prison. Uh, my name is Michael Pike. Um AKA White Bread, as they call me on the yard. I got involved in gangs at a young age. Um, became part of the Gangster Disciples, GDs, and started making a name for myself, doing things on the streets that pair in comparison to a lot of noble things <coughs> that other people, you know, think the gang life is all about. Um, started selling drugs really heavy. Uh, Gotten real big in that, and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, by the way. Uh, I got busted when I was 21. I was uh, got busted for what they call the kingpin status in Georgia. In North Carolina, where I'm at now, it's, it's called the uh, uh, RICO Act, which is the organized, the organized Crime Act. It deals with gangs, racketeering, drugs, um, anything dealing with illegal activity. And considered an empire. Um, I was told on by my so-called best friend, a guy I grew up with, we, worked, we shared the same diaper bag. Um, he ended up ratting me out to get off of a burglary case, um, which is all the state in Georgia needed. You know, they have kind of the same thing the feds have. They have a conspiracy thing. If one or more people say it, then it's got to be true in their eyes. Um, which in my case, it was true. Um, ended up fighting it, took it to trial. He took the stand on me, pointed me out. And that was all the jury needed to hear, you know, somebody else saying that I did it. Uh, judge went off of the guideline. My guideline was supposed to be a mandatory <clears throat> sentencing of 20 years. He ended up giving me life. Um, and it just, Went from there, man. I, I didn't think I'd ever see daylight again, so yeah, I ended up going to prison in Georgia. Let's talk about that for a minute, though. You're 21 years old. The judge sentenced you to life for selling drugs. Any violence in the case? Yeah, there was a couple armed robberies. There was um, um assault with intent to kill. Uh, that was a part of it. Um, where somebody had got their finger cut off. Um, there was a couple instances. Where it's all right. And listen, you sound like you're a little bit nervous, but look, we'll get through that bit, part. Man, you know, a little bit. You know, a little camera shy, as they say. Man, that camera ain't nothing compared to that Georgia Department of Corrections, is it? Hell no. <laughs> so uh, no reason to be scared up in here. But anyway, so you end up you go into you go into this Georgia Department of Corrections with a life sentence. Who's holding you down? Your mom looking out for you? Who's looking out for you? Man, truthfully, dude, everybody turned their back on me, man. I didn't have Nobody. I didn't get one letter, one phone call, no money, nothing, zero. So we're going to talk a little bit about your prison experience. I know you've done some things in prison that maybe you're not proud of now, but I think you did some things because you felt like you had to survive. And in that system, it's kind of a kill or be killed system, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's just definitely, man, I've heard people talk about <clears throat> Vietnam and the things they've seen and experienced over there. And... It doesn't compare. The things that I've seen and experienced in Georgia Penitentiary were by far a million times worse than anybody has ever described being there. So let me ask you this. You walk in at 21. Do the people embrace you right away? Your homeboys, the GDs? I mean, do you have to make a mark right away? So, yo, this is a white definitely dude that gets not, busy? Definitely not. Um, I've always been a big guy. Um, 6'1". I went in there 6'1", 220 pounds. Um, but went there off the rip, you know, GD, you know, letting them, letting them know what it was. And um, I felt like, you know, all the stories that I had heard that I was going to have to make a name for myself as soon as I went in there. Um, I didn't realize at the time, my first prison was Hayes State Prison, um, which is one of the top five prisons, worst prisons in the United States. Um, I didn't realize at the time that it was going to be the way it was. 
I knew it was going to be bad, but I had no idea it was going to be what it was. And when I went in there, the very first day I was in there, I walk in the dorm. And as soon as I walk in the dorm, you had 50 people rush you. There were dorm of 96 people, half the dorm surround you and start questioning you. They, all they want to do, they don't care if you're a punk. They don't care if you're a homosexual. They don't care about none of that shit. They want to make sure you're not a rat. So they press you, they get all your information, and they get straight on the cell phone. Boom. They call the streets. You know, there is no calling another fucking prison. They're calling the streets. And there's big enough people in there that they can call their police buddy on the police chief, on police force and find out what the fuck you did, who you ratted on. You know, they've got those kind of people in there. And um, I sat there for about 30 minutes, didn't even get my shit out past the front door while they did a full check, back, background check on me, checked on me. They found out I was stamped, I was official GD. My brothers came, they embraced me, they picked my shit up, took it to my room, um, gave me a care package, gave me a knife. It was like, look, you know, it was like, listen, man, you know, we got you. Don't get yourself in no shit, you know, but when it's time to go, which is pretty much every fucking day, it's time to go. I'm like, shit, that's what's up, man. You know, on the streets, I live for that shit. You know, it's like, cool. You know, to me, it's like, damn, okay. I get a little red. Cool. Well, let's, let's talk a little I, bit about. When, when they give you the knife, I mean, you're like balls. Of, uh, yo, I'm ready. It's whatever. That's how you're feeling because yeah. you got a life sentence? I, in my mind, in my mind, I had already in the county, I sat in the county nine months waiting to go to prison. And I had already sat there and I had already processed to myself like I'll never see daylight again. You know, I'm thinking to myself, life, I'll never, I'll never touch the streets again. So in my mind, it was, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to do whatever I have to do to make somebody kill me. And I, you know, I'm, I, I guess you'd call me a coward. You know, I'm not going to kill myself. And uh, I had already made it in my mind that I'm going to go in here and I'm going to stab as many people as I need to stab. I'm going to jump on as many people as I need to jump on. I'm going to jump on the guards. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to make them kill me because there's no way I want to do a life sentence in here. I mean, you think a lot of young dudes that get life like that at 21, 22 feel that way? Like, man, I ain't never getting out. So it is what it is. And, you know, honestly, from what I've seen, a lot of people's minds don't work the way mine work. And I know what I had left. You know, I know the reputations in the streets that I had left. I know the things that I was doing. Um, you know, I was dealing with uh, the Mexican cartel, which, you know, a high traffic cartel. You know, I've been on yachts. I've done the things that ordinary people have never done and I had done it all by 21 and I just couldn't see myself settling for less you know and I just knew that my life was over so I was going to do whatever I had to do to rush those that rush that process along you know I've seen some videos I had a homeboy over there in in, in Georgia State Prison and he sent me yeah, videos man where that huh I did two years at Georgia State too this kid had sent me some pictures over there from, you know, in Georgia, man, where, you know, these dudes were tying people up and. Oh yeah. That was, I mean, that was, I've done normal. I've been there numerous times. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a normal, that's a normal thing. So let's talk a little bit about, so you were in prison in Georgia. You're serving life in Georgia, not Carolina, right? No, um, I'll, I'll get to that later on. You know, I'll, I'll explain to you exactly how I ended up in North Carolina. All right. So, where are you doing your time at though right now? You're in Georgia. You're in Georgia with a life sentence, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. What's it like inside that prison system? I know you put some work in, you've done some violent Man. things. Well, I mean, what have you had um, to do? The very first day I was there, it was two hours after I got there. I had just got my bed made and the cell next door to me. Um the bloods were in the process of exiting one of their own out. They go in there and they stabbed him three, four hundred times. He was dead before they got through stabbing him. Um, raping him with broomsticks. And they were filming it. They were filming it the entire time. We're going to stay away from the R word because of YouTube. But it's all right. Keep yeah. going. They were filming it the entire time. Um, 
like I said, he was dead before they ever got through stabbing him. And it was like one would come out, another would go in. And I just stood there, you know what I'm saying? I'm standing at my door. I'm like, whoa, I'm not quite sure if this is what the fuck I signed up for. You know what I mean? Like, at first I was all like, yeah, let's get it. And then as soon as, you know, this happens, as soon as, it, you know, I'm all for it, it's like, what the fuck? And it hit me. It was like, you know what? You know, the kind of work you were thinking about putting in might not be exactly what you were signing up for. So, you know, it was, it was definitely a terrifying experience. And But I'll say this. It was like, it was like the streets, Georgia Penitentiary, is like the most violent hood you could ever go into in the United States or in the world. <laughs> it's like the most violent hood you'll ever go into um, without the females. It's <laughs> A street inside of a prison cell. And instead of guns, they got knives, right? Say what? Instead of guns, they got knives. Man, they have, look, they they took down all the locker boxes because people were taking them and, and literally how they would bend them and do the things they would do with the metal was insane. They were making swords, like literal samurai swords out of these motherfucking box, locker boxes and beds. And, you know, it... it yeah, it was insane, the weaponry they had. I mean, there, there was instances where there were guns on the process, on the camp, like real pistols, you know what I mean? Like, it, it got pretty intense for a long time, you know what I mean? What's it like for a white dude being in a black, you know, a predominantly black gang? What's it like for you? Do you got to you know, prove yourself? I mean. Well, I dealt with all that when I was younger. Um, yeah, of course, there was still... There were still people that were like, yeah, you know, you know who's, who's this dude? You know what I'm saying? I still had to make, you know, I had to let it be known. You know, those people that were like, mm, those are the people that I slapped. You know, I was like, bitch, fuck you. You know what I'm saying? Like, it is what it is. This is who I am. I dealt with all the backlash of that when I was a kid. I put in my stripes when I was a kid. So I didn't feel like I really had to earn that anymore because I had already been in it for over 10 years. I'm not talking about what you think you had to earn, but when you get to the penitentiary, I mean, are these some of these black dudes looking at you like, man, who's this white boy, yeah, man? Yeah, de definitely. And um, <sighs> and the white boys are the same way. You know what I mean? Like, the, the backlash that I got from my own brothers was minimal. Um, you had a few that would make comments, especially uh, the BGD, Black Gangster Disciple. They were really big on, you know, it's like they're, you know, their belief sort of like Aryan Brotherhood. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a racial thing, you know what I'm saying? They don't believe a white boy is supposed to be GD, you know, so they make whatever comments, you know, of course they're sideways comments. Most of them don't speak directly to you. They'll speak, in, you know, they'll speak out of the neck about something. You know it's directed at you, but it's not directed at you, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, I had those comments. I never had anybody, well, I'll tell you that. I've had it one time, but overall, I was accepted. I was accepted because on the second day I was there, I stabbed somebody. You know, it was like I went, there was no talking about it. I got called a bitch at the poker table, and I stabbed somebody in the neck that day. You know, there was no more talking about it. But, that, you know, as I said, my mind frame was make somebody kill me. So as soon as I got called a bitch, I don't even know if he was talking to me now that I think about it. But as soon as he said the word bitch, I stabbed him. And all the brothers on the camp was like, yo, this kid is for real. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't have step. You know, he's going to stab He's going to stab you. You know, they didn't know if I could fight yet. They didn't know about none of that shit. All they knew was that I would stab you. So, you know, my brothers kind of embraced me more because of that. The white boys, on the other hand, I had so much shit on the white boys. Most of the wars I was in, most of the conversations I was in was dealing with them feeling like I was a betrayal to my race. And that offended me. You know what I'm saying? I have, my wife is black now. I have a black brother. You know, a real live blood brother. My, he's mixed. Uh, I have black nieces and nephews. So I took high offense whenever I heard the word rigor or impersonator or you know betrayal of your race or i took a severe and a high level of offense to it and it was like 
a black person, a white person calls a black dude the N-word, you know what I'm saying? Like, the offense that they get is the same offense that I got whenever they told me I was betraying my, my race. So you talk about beefing with some of them dudes, man. What are some of the things that you got? I know you asked me on a text message, hey, can I talk about certain things? And I said, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can talk about whatever whatever your life experience was in that system. You can talk about it. So tell us some of the stuff that you've been through, some of the stuff that you did. I mean, the poker table, whatever, but what else had happened in your life? Uh, a little back history. My grandfather is Whitey Lester. He's one of the founding fathers of the Dixie Mafia. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Um, I know the Dixie Mafia is, but I didn't know who your grandfather was. His name's Whitey Lester. Yeah, he's one of the founding fathers of the Dixie Mafia. So I grew up in an era uh, where intimidation and fear was the leading points of life. You know, my grandfather told me at a young age, he said, if you implement a certain amount of fear in people, then you can control people. So... What happened was, is my roommate was one of the mess cartels. He was getting in pounds of meth at a time. And he was selling throughout the whole camp. You know, he would, he would break it down and I'd push it through the whole camp for him. I would take it from to every, every gang member, every, you know, every, all the heads would get a piece of the pie and I would shoot it out for him. Well, one time I went to the Aryan Brotherhood, well, uh, the ABT, Aaron Brotherhood, Texas, went to their founder and or their leader, and I went to him, and he was getting an ounce and a half, and I went to give it to him, and he was like, you want to go and you want to tell him that you got, that you had to flush it, that you was about to get busted, or I'm going to kill you. So I was like, I was like, say what? He was like, you're going to tell your roommate, just simple as this. That you had to flush it and he'll chalk it off because you're his runner and I won't kill you. So I was like, man, he was a big old dude, you know what I'm saying? Like he was a big dude. So I was like, man, I was like, do you know who the fuck I am? You know what I'm saying? That's the first thing, like, that was my that was my favorite phrase on the street, you know, like, do you know who the fuck I am? And he started laughing. And as soon as he did, I took my knife out and I stabbed him in the hand. And when I stabbed him, it cut his pinky finger off. And I looked at him while I stabbed him and I said, bitch, I will kill you today, right now. And he was like, all right, all right, all right. You know what I'm saying? So, they, so I left and I just knew in my mind, I was like, well, this just started a war, you know? So I went to my my leader and I was like, you know, I went to my, the, my SP and I was like, look, bro, you know, this is what went on. This is how it happened. And he was like, man, don't worry about it, bro. So I went back to the, my Mexico cartel bump, and I told him what happened. And as soon as I did, he said some shit in Spanish. He was like, bruh, bruh, bruh. And it was like 50 Mexicans right there. And I was like, what the fuck? And they went over there and stabbed up this whole crew. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and took the dope back. And I was like, well, you know, and that right there got a name, you know, that, that right there boosted my name. And it wasn't intentional to boost my name. It was really, it was me scared shitless. You know what I'm saying? I'm thinking this dude's about to go ahead and kill me now. And I just know that if I would have submitted to hit that, I would have looked weak and everybody would have took that. In Georgia, if you allow one person, it doesn't make a fuck how small the infraction is. If you allow one person to implement any kind of disrespect your way, everybody will do it. You become prey. And in Georgia prison, you do not want to become right at all. Understandable. I know it's a dangerous place. You know what I mean? So, I mean, you're over there in Georgia. You're, you know, you're doing what you got to do, whatever. What makes you start going to the law library, man? Man, honestly, I went to the hole. Um, at Hayes State Prison, I was there about nine months and was, we had a riot. Um, it was a pretty intense one. Um, a couple of police were killed. Um, I'm sitting there and uh, police gets dropped off the top tier. He's already dead before he hits the ground. And then a buffer gets dropped on his head and I just watch it explode like a watermelon when the buffer hits him. And I just kind of blanked. And apparently I ended up killing a guy 
during the riot and ended up getting sent to the shoe for, uh, I stayed in the shoe for right at four years. In Georgia, they do not want to prosecute you on anything. They would prefer to just do in-house punishments for 99.9% .9 of their offenses. And this was one of the offenses. They considered it during the commission of a riot. Anybody could have done it, so to say, but I ended up taking the brunt hit of it. Ended up staying in the shoe for almost four years. Um, I transferred from two different shoes during that stay because of other violent situations, but the shoe is, the only thing you have is the law library. And that's, I was six days from being late from filing my first appeal or I would have lost all appeal process rights. You know, you have so many days before you, before it runs out, you know, if you don't file it within this many days, you can't file it. And I was six days before that. So it was kind of a blessing that I ended up in the shoe. You go to the shoe, you end up filing your stuff and you win and, you know, you end no, up. No, man, I didn't win. It, like I said, it took, I didn't win my appeal at all. I fought it for, I fought it for nine and a half years and never won it. Uh, I got denied at every level on every avenue that I filed it under. I got denied. Um, I didn't know what to look for. I was just shooting, shooting at ghosts. You know, if anything looked good or remotely close to what I was looking for, I shot at it. Yeah. And I kept playing, I kept failing. And um, I was at uh, Valdosta State Prison, which is also another bad prison in Georgia. And um, they have a thing called fight night. And every night, it don't make fuck who you are in the dorm we were in, 96 people in the dorm. You know, you laced up, you drew hats. Everybody in the fucking dorm fought. Didn't matter if you was 99 years old or if you was you know, the youngest person in the dorm. You drew a name and you got you a, you got you a 30 second fight in. That's all it was. You go in the room for 30 seconds, you throw hands. You know, if you don't throw hands, you get your fucking ass whooped. But if you don't, if neither one of you throw hands, then both of you get beat up. So they got, hold on, let me stop you for a minute because people are watching this right now like, what? So they got fight night and everybody in the unit has to fight. Everybody. Everybody. Old, everybody young. They wanted to make sure that nobody was soft. They wanted to make sure that if we ever went to a war with another unit, even though we had our internal wars inside the unit, there were still dorm unit wars. And they wanted to make sure that if we ever went to war with another unit, that everybody would go. They didn't want nobody to fucking duck out of it. So they called themselves preparing for it. So they got a fight night in Georgia State Prison. You think they still got that going on? Oh yeah, I talked. I, I still talk. Cell phones is a normal thing in Georgia prison. Like when I say normal, ninety-six people in a dorm, sixty of them have cell phones. And I still talk to. I still talk to my Mexican roommate. I still talk to numerous people that were in there with me. So yeah, they still do the fight night. It's not quite as intense as it used to be, but you know now it's more or less the Bloods fight the Crips. The GDs fight the vice lords. Um, you know, the Aryan Brotherhood fight each other, you know, because there's 700 different specs of their gang, which I never understood. You know, that's one reason why I wouldn't join them, you know. It was, you know. Let me ask you this, right? <clears throat> Inside that Georgia Department of Corrections, I mean, it's off the chain. What do you think all the problems stem from? Is it the staff? Is it the food? Is it. You know, they're giving all these young kids life sentences. No one cares. What's that, the reason for it? That is the main thing. In Georgia, in Georgia, it, Georgia's probably the most sentencing state in the United States. They give out the most time. It doesn't matter. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, an armed robbery, doesn't matter if it's with a gun or a knife or a spoon. It's a mandatory 10 years, and you have to do every day of it. You're like, there's no parole on it. You have to do 10 years. You know, let me ask you, know, you this. Cocaine, oh, go cocaine, ahead. I'm sorry. Cocaine, methamphetamine, and heroin are violent crimes. So if you get busted for those, not only are you going to get a lot of time for it, 
you're going to a violent prison because it's a violent crime. And not another thing, they don't really have a classification system like other states. My roommate one time, he was in there for fucking identity identity fraud. You know, like he's in there with all the murders and killers with the lifers, and he's got a six month sentence. You know, so they don't really have a classification sentence uh, sentencing board like other states have. It's more or less wherever the fuck they got a bed for you, that's where you're gonna go. So it's kind of like, man, zebras with lions, right? Yeah. And that's another part of the reason why they don't really implement uh, taking people back to court for violent charges in prison. Because they know they put people in positions where either they defend themselves or they're dead. So if you put somebody in that kind of position, there's no reason for you to punish them again for having to defend themselves. Because a lot of the, a lot of times people get killed in there it's a lot of times it's self-defense, you know. Um, <clears throat> the time I was in there, the first seven years I was in there, like I said, I didn't get a letter from home. I didn't get any money from home. I didn't get anything. So I got the okay from my SP to take hits. Um, I would get paid to do wet work is what they call it, you know. If you needed somebody stabbed up real bad, beat up real bad, uh, taught a lesson, you need somebody's finger cut off, whatever you want it done to them, I would do it for the right amount of money so I could live in there. And I did that for the first seven years I was in there. And it, and I had to become somebody, man, that was fucking a horrible person. You know what I'm saying? Like, I couldn't look myself in the mirror. You know what I mean? Like, like it was, it became a really dark time for me. You know what I mean? Let me ask you this, because people are going to want to know. I mean, what were people paying? You, had, you to stab someone up? What would yeah, you get paid? I, my main thing was fifty cent people. People love to give people fifty cents, which was I would take three razors, put it on a comb, and melt it down, and I would hit somebody across the face, normally from their mouth to their ear, with three razors, and I would open them up, and for the rest of their life, they're going to have to look at themselves as disfigured for whatever offense they committed. Um, Chomos didn't live on yard period. I know in North Carolina they have it where they could pay rent and they could do this. We didn't tolerate it at all in North Carolina. They had a special prison in Georgia that they sent them to. If one of them got loose and got to one of the other prisons and they got found out, they were normally dead. Let me ask you this, right? What was it, what were you getting paid to do something like that at 50 cent or whatever the hell you're talking about? I'd get paid $150 for 50 cent. Um, what? I'd get paid $500 for a multiple stabbing. Um, it means you either stab somebody three or more times, $500. Um, I would get paid uh, $1,000 to cut somebody's finger off, which I've only done twice. Um, now, look, man, some people are going to be on here like, man, this dude's capping, man. He wasn't cutting people's fingers off in prison. Oh, man. Oh, dead ass. Like, um, <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, I didn't do it alone. I had people help and hold them down. and But I would ultimately look them in the eye while I did it. And I would explain to them, like, this is what the fuck you did. You know what I'm saying? Like. Let me just say this, right? Because I got videos that I can't put on YouTube, right? Maybe I can start putting them up on Discord. I got a bunch of videos from Atlanta where they got this cho, I mean, from Georgia, where they got this, this chomo, right? And they tell him, stand in the air and jump and fall on your knees. And they kept making him jump and fall on his knees on the concrete. I have videos where these Mexicans have this dude tied up to the bed, a white dude, with his arms tied like this, right? He's tied up, and they're taking a pencil and gripping his fingers. They got machetes. And then they're just blasting them in the ribs. I got videos of dudes, I mean, killing dudes in, in Georgia, right? I can't. I mean, honestly, I would have to look for them, man, but I've got videos of me cutting my finger off. Like, uh, Listen, bro, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to advise you, I'm going to advise you against putting that on out yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's one reason why I haven't even searched for them. <laughs> uh, but I'm sure I can call my Mexican cartel buddy, man. He still got it on one of his phones. Yeah. Yeah, I, I probably wouldn't, you know, get into that. But anyway. So, wow, I guess I'm stuck for words right now, bro. Because I don't want people to think that you're capping. I want people to know that this stuff's really happening in Georgia. 
Alabama, Georgia, Florida's pretty bad. I mean, I thought, you know, the feds are bad, right? But nothing compared to them places. And, you know, people don't understand. When I tell you it's like the streets inside of a prison wall, people have girlfriends, the punks. You'll get killed over them. The prisons run the close custody Georgia prison. You know, and that's just being honest. You know what I'm saying? Like, if somebody is bold enough to walk around with a punk, it's their girlfriend. I mean, they have picnics on the fucking yard with them. You better not say nothing to them. You better not even look at them too hard because it'll get you killed. You know, uh, the shot callers are the ones that have them. You know, the people that are making all the moves and doing all the real shit, so, so to speak, as far as the dopes and the phones, they're the ones that are with the pump. Let me ask you this because people are going to want to know, man. You know, now that you're home, you're a father and all of that stuff, do you have remorse for some of the shit you did in there? Man, I want to tell you like this, man. I suffer every day with post-traumatic stress disorder for the things that I've done, the acts that I've committed, the person I had to become. Um, and it's still in me. I still find myself doing some, let me rephrase that. I've done shit since I've been home on the streets that are prison-like and I regret. Um, I still wake up with nightmares, cold sweats. Uh, I find myself confused sometimes. Um, I struggle with it every day. And do I regret it? Yeah, some of it. Do I wish I could change it? No. I don't wish I could change one thing that I've ever had to do in my life because it wouldn't got me to where I'm at today. It wouldn't got me to with my wife. I wouldn't be with her today if it wasn't for the things that I did in there. Let me ask you this. How long have you been out? I got out March 21st, 2016 um, from Augusta State Prison. Um, I've been back twice in North Carolina. Um, I'll get up to that. I, like I said, I was in there for seven years, and uh, I cut hair. And I, had, I woke up early in the morning to cut somebody's hair for visitation. I go in there, cut it with a razor and comb. Get them right for Vizzo. I make four dollars. They got a high state poker game going on. It's been going on for like three days. There's probably six thousand dollars in the poker kitty. I know I'm not going to win. You know, this is what I'm telling myself. Like fuck it, I'll play a hand. So I get down for four dollars, and I end up winning seven hundred eighty dollars. I won a cell phone. The first one I got, even though I made all this money doing all the wet work I was doing, I never thought to get a phone. But I had heard about all these people hustling with the phone. So I'm like, fuck it, I'll get one. You know what I'm saying? I had used other people's phone, trying to call my family, trying to get in touch with people, but I never got through, never got in touch with anybody. So I didn't fuck it. You know what I'm saying? I just gave up on it. And uh, But my payout was a cell phone and a quarter of weed. So I go back to the room. And granted, when I went to prison, a flip phone with the camera, it was AT&T, a flip phone that had a camera on it. It just came out, and I got a touch screen in the poker game seven years later, so I didn't know how to turn the motherfucker on. So I'm fucking like, fuck it. So I'm going to give it, I'm going to go trade it to my roommate for ice because I started using ice for him. And um, against my laws, against everything that the gang stood for, but they let it go because, like I said, I had already made a name for myself. Like, it didn't make a fuck who you were, you know, I was going fuck up top, you know what I mean? Like, so they let it go as long as I controlled it and maintained it and didn't let it affect them. Well, I was going to go trade the phone for some ice for my roommate. And he was like, man, he said, you got a Facebook account? I said, Facebook? The fuck is Facebook? You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't even know what it was. And he was like, man, he said, what's your email? I said, what the fuck is an email? I didn't even know what the email was. And because I had never used a computer. You know, I had never done any of that. <clears throat> so he said, sit down, man, sit down. And uh, I sit down, man. He sent me up an email account and he sent me up a Facebook account. And, you know, Facebook sends you 10 people at the beginning of your account that they feel like would be good friends for you on Facebook. Well, how it happened, I don't know. But the very first picture I seen up there was my wife. 
and it had a caption under her name that says, has anybody found their white knight? So I started laughing. He's like, what's funny? I was like, I said, ask her if, ask her if she has. So he texted back, and it was just two words, and it was, have you? And me and my wife have been together ever since. She, uh, she started coming to visit me once every month and a half, two months. She started sending me money, so I didn't have to do any more work, wet work. She actually asked me to stop, because I kept it real with her. You know, I told her off the real, you know, like, look, man, I'm not sure if this is what you want. And uh, she was like, you know, let's give it a shot. You know, my wife, she's older than I am, but she's a school teacher. She's super religious. She's never done a drug, never cussed. She doesn't do any of that. You know, she's a really good woman. And, um, you know, I felt like I had to learn more about what she was into so our conversations could go smoother. You know, we could have more of a dialogue when we spoke. So I started reading the Bible. I started, you know, investing time into that because that's what she was into. And I wanted to get more into the things that she was into. Well, while I was doing that, it started, I guess you could say, softening me up a little bit. Um, I was still doing a lot of the bullshit that I was doing to start with. Um, but I was doing it. There was a lot more regret when I'd done it. Like, I would stab somebody and I'd be like, fuck, you know what I mean? Like, damn. And, um. I found, I found myself coming out of the dark place I was in, and I started feeling like I had a reason to live. I would lose my phone in a raid, and my wife would buy me another one. You know, like, I didn't have to do, I found myself to at a point, if I would have started my sentence with somebody like her, I probably would have done half of the things that I did while I was in there. Definitely understandable, man. Um. <laughs> I'm, I mean, you're, you're out now, though. Are you working? What are you doing? Man, I was. I was doing tile floors. Um, I've worked at a couple of plants. Um, I have, I like I said, I suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder really bad. Um, I couldn't go into a Walmart, a grocery store. I couldn't go in those places when I first got out. And if I did, I would panic. Um, I'd be so nervous and jittery and... I would start snapping at my wife and um, eventually, you know, I see, I sought out mental health treatment, started talking to a counselor, started uh, getting meds. I said, I got to put on a med medicine. So you sought out, you know, this mental health treatment and all of that stuff, you, you know, you're living a better life, but I know you said you ended up going back to prison in North Carolina. What was that for? Um, like I said, I still had a lot of contact with the people from Georgia prison, and I started going back and forth to Georgia, throwing stuff over the prison fences for a couple different people, and I kept in touch with my roommate, which was Miss Cartel, and I started going back and forth to Georgia, picking up drugs, you know, a large quantity of drugs at a time because it was a lot cheaper. And uh, I ended up getting busted in North Carolina for sales and delivery. Um, ended up pulling eight, 17 months off of that. And then I get busted uh, another time for uh, burglary, which is where I received stolen goods for drugs. And I got charged for the burglary for having the item. Um, so I ended up doing, I ended up doing a little over two years uh, in Georgia, in North Carolina. What was that prison system like? Was it violent? Did you get involved in violence or did you just relax? Georgia is a super, I mean, Georgia, North Carolina is a super soft prison system. Like, it's not talking about shit. Like, I went in there, man. I went in there. I was already the IT. I, was, I went in there with the highest rank for GDs on the yard. Um, I, was, I went in there and shot callers. Like, it was... It was insane. Like there was no proving yourself. There was nothing. I knew my I knew my shit. I was on top of my on my lit. I was fucking that, and I went in. Like I was like I didn't. I'm from used to Georgia prison system, so I went in there in North Carolina. Everybody's calling each other bitches and hoes, and it, it's okay. You know what I'm saying? The first person to call me a bitch, I slapped the fuck out of them right there. Boom, on the spot in front of the police. 
So it was it was like the intimidation level that I put out as soon as I got there was extraordinary considering the Senate, you know, my Georgia Senate. I went in there thinking I had to be the same way and it was too much. Even my own homies was like trying to stay away from me because they were scared. They didn't know what to expect. They didn't know, they didn't know if at any moment I was going to go in and they really weren't built for that shit. Even, even on the streets right here in North Carolina, I don't have no problem saying it to you because I'll say it out there. There's only a handful of GDs that I even recognize. Like this is a super soft fucking state. Let me ask you this though. How old are you now? I'm 38. 38. When does the gang life end? Does it ever end? Man, you know, I fall in the 720 concept now. Um, it's something I believe in. It's something that if implemented and followed to the structural T is a blessing to the community. It's a blessing to everyone. Um, does it end the way I was brought up, the way I believe, what I believe, the morals and standards that I follow? No, it doesn't end. No, you don't jump ship. You know, there is a retirement phase. There is uh, a phase to where you're not, you're no longer active as far as it comes to, you know, putting in work. Um, but I don't believe in what they call rolling over, changing games. I don't believe in that shit. You know what I'm saying? Where I'm from, it's not a real thing. You know, it's not something that is accepted. And as far as leaving the game, where I'm from, there's no such thing. And here, there's only one other person that I even associate. Well, there's two other people that I even associate with, really, when it comes to the GD shit here. And to me, they're solid. You met one of them. Um, my brother Dylan, that was on one of your shows. Um, I won't turn my, I'll never turn my back on him. I'll always be there. Solid dude. Um, but as far as leaving it, no. And I stand on it alone. You know what I'm saying? Even though he's with me sometimes, you know what I mean? Like, I do this alone. Like, when I'm in the streets, when some shit pop off, you know what I'm saying? I throw my shit up right then, and I let it be known, like, shit. GD nigga, you know what I'm saying? Like it is what it is. And if you don't like it, get some straightening, you know what I'm saying? Nine times out of ten, man, ain't nobody will want that smoke. So as far as leaving it, no. You know, you know I just mean that in a different I mean that in a different sense though. You know what I mean? I think when, you know, we get older and we change our lives and we're husbands and we're fathers, I feel like, man, we probably, you know, you can believe what you believe and what you want, but I feel like my gang now is my kids, man, my wife, and my family. Hey, don't get me wrong. I have three grandkids. You know right. what I'm saying? Like, I take very good care of my family. We live good. Nobody comes to my house on the bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Like, I live the life that you're talking about right now. But I'm still a GD. You know what I'm saying? I'm still that person. That's where I get to the point where you're in a retirement stage. You know, if it comes down to a situation to where I need to put my input in, I put my input in. But if not, I stay out of it. And I stay home, man. Listen, I'm home 99% of the time. I don't leave. You know what I mean? This is what I do. I stay at the house and I take care of these babies. You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm not in the streets actively anymore. No. If, if you're talking about leaving that way, yeah, I've left that way. Okay, cool. Let me ask you one more thing before we get ready to go. Because you do know a little bit about that Georgia law. Young Thug's going to trial. He's got a conspiracy case for gangs, right? Kind of like a Rico. What do you think, man? You think he gets acquitted or you think he's going down? I think he's I think he's in trouble. Yeah, if he if he's already if he's got it, let me tell you about the thing about conspiracy. Conspiracy doesn't take any physical evidence whatsoever. And that's the bad thing about conspiracy. They don't have to prove shit. All they have to do is thank you, dude, and have somebody else say, yeah, he did it. They don't have to have anything physical. 
Conspiracy is the worst crime, the worst charge that they can. Conspiracy is the worst law they ever invented. And it hinders a lot of people. You know what I mean? It, it's a lot. There's a lot of people that serve in time for conspiracy that actually had nothing to fucking do with it. Young thug, man. Let's say, you know, I hope for his sake, right, that he wins somehow. But let's say he walks into, you know. Got him. The feds got him? No, it's, it's a state case. State. state of Georgia. So he's got he's got that thing going on in Georgia. He walks into Georgia State Prison. He's going to trial right now. Just started. Some of his co-defendants have, you know, copped out oh, or whatever. He's got co-defendants? Plenty of them. Oh, he's dead. Yeah, so let me let me say I this, hate right? To say that. I hate to say that, but. What's his life like when he walks into Georgia State Prison? He's associated with the Bloods, Young Slime Life, Rapper, Big Money. What's his life like when he goes to Georgia? He's like, oh, he's, he's known in the street. He's known in the streets as a rapper. Like, is he big time? Yeah, I mean, you're from Atlanta. You don't know who Young Thug is? Oh, Young Thug. Oh, no. Nah. He's, he's going he's going to protect custody as soon as he gets there. He'll never touch a regular compound. You really believe that? They'll stick him in there? Oh, I know they will. They did the same thing with Akon. They did. I mean, yeah, he's not. Uh, uh, Gucci Man, when he went, they do. He went a whole year and a half. He was in there. He was protected custody. They have a special wing just for those people. Celebrity type people. Yeah. They don't, they don't let them touch compounds. All right, so we're going to get ready to go, man. But is there anything you want to say before we take off? Man, I'll just say this, man. You know, it was a blessing being on your platform, being able to tell my story. Um, I've dumbed it down a lot. It was a lot more intense. George is not a place for you to do a crime. The system there is really rough. Um it's best not to even do crime, y'all, man. Just stay focused on education, betterment of yourself, your community, your family. Stay focused and stay strong. Well, listen, man, I appreciate you coming on, sharing your stories, your experiences. I do like to talk about Georgia because I want these people to realize, like, you do not want to go to prison. This is a dangerous place where it's it's literally dog eat dog, man. Kill or be killed or, you know, if you got to eat. It's your own people a lot of times. Like, like I got stabbed 17 times by my own people. And, well, when the Gangster Disciples went and became, went to follow the 720 concept, and in Georgia, if you're anything but 720, you're considered a renegade. I got wet up by the renegades. You know what I mean? Like, I got hit 17 times. So, you know... It's definitely a doggy doggy world, doggy dog world, definitely. No doubt. But again, man, I appreciate you coming on. I'm gonna tell everybody, man, if you like what we're doing, hit that subscribe button, share the video with respect. Definitely. Blood on the razor wire TV until tomorrow we're out. <laughs>